Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Working Differently and Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along this morning. Our guest today is Christine Geith. On July 1st, she became the CEO of the eExtension Foundation. Prior to that, she was an assistant provost and executive director of MSU Global and Innovation and Strategy Unit at Michigan State University. And we're glad that she could take the time uh, at a very busy time, I'm sure, for her uh, to uh, join us here on the podcast. Chris, welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. Thanks, Bob. I've been uh, looking forward to this. Thanks for uh, arranging it and setting it up. This is a really good time because uh, I hope uh, we can talk about some new ideas and get questions. So it's a great time to be doing this. Thank you. I want to remind our uh, viewers and, and listeners that uh, you can, uh, during this live recording, uh, share your questions with Chris as well. We've got the Q&A app turned on in uh, the Google Plus Hangout. Uh, you can also post your questions to the Google Plus event page. Or if you want to tweet them, just include a mention of Working Differently in Extension. Our Twitter handle is WDNEXT. That's WDNEXT. Include that in your, in your tweet and uh, we will get your question to Chris. So Chris, big, exciting uh, new adventure, I'm sure for you in this new position uh, after 15 years at Michigan State with MSU Global. So why did you decide to take the job and uh, become the CEO of the eExtension Foundation? <laughs> Well, I couldn't, I couldn't resist, actually. At Michigan State's a land-grant university, so we have extension. And some of my early projects and some of my very first projects at MSU Global were online learning programs with extension, like uh, we did advanced master gardening programs, you know, e-learning. We did, had a project with Lowe's with our master gardener program. This is over a decade ago now. We have, we've worked with Citizen Planner for land use planning, and there's been others. So, you know, I was familiar with that. And then... I got involved, I was invited a couple years ago and the first conversation started about the redoing of the strategy for extension and I had met uh, the CIO, former CIO Kevin Gamble years before and we had kept in touch, we kind of had been bonding on the open education resources movement, you know, we share that value set in terms of open licensing and open data. So I was very familiar and I knew about it, although I wasn't embedded in extension but I really love extension work and I love it working with people who are trying to make a difference in the world on issues in their community. So people working on water, other natural resources issues, energy, food, food systems, human nutrition, family health, community prosperity, all those themes are really in, important to me. I'm a community gardener. I didn't do it this year because my plot turned to grass last year, but you know, I've been working in Detroit with some of the people on the Food Plus Detroit Coalition. I just love that work. So when I had the opportunity to consider this position, I thought, oh, it would just, I can't imagine anything more fun than taking all the things I've learned and the people that I've done things with for the past almost 25 years in online and distance learning and in knowledge systems and in applying it to helping the people who are working on those issues in communities. I just couldn't resist. How could I say no to that? <laughs> So that's why I did it. I'm, this is really my dream job. Um, I didn't realize until after it already started, which I got a little bit of a head start. So it's been about a month that I've been working with people, maybe five weeks or so. And uh, I realized, man, you know what? This is this is truly extension and e-extension are truly network ecosystem organizations. What other organizations strive to be, we were built that way 100 years ago. Extension was built that way, and e-extension with some of the really good foresight around communities of practice and emerging trends and, and openness, I thought, oh my gosh, there's, I don't have to build that. It's already, you know, it's already here. Now I just get to build on top of that and build on those great assets. So I love it. I'm just, like I said, this is my dream job. E-Extension's gone through some changes in the last several, several months. Were there certain things about sort of the new rebooted e-extension that resonated with you in a way that, that you know, made you more interested in the position? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, as I said, I think they called me a key informant, so some of my thinking is in that new strategic framework. And there, yeah, there are a lot of aspects that appeal to me. One of them is, you know, e-learning and online learning is one of my areas of expertise, and I see lots of opportunities to wield that in service to professional development 
for the what we think are 15,000 or so, you know, extension educators and specialists and and agents that are out in the field across the country. Plus, we've got an army of volunteers. Uh, I learned it when I visited NIFA last week that there's something like 500,000. 4-H volunteers and 90,000 master gardener volunteers. So if you look at the extended network, we have you know we have quite an impact. So professional development's a key piece. Uh, states don't have the resources they used to to do as much as they'd like for the people in the field. You know their own staff in terms of skill development to actually move on issues. You know do things like conflict resolution and writing impact statements for evaluation. So those are some things I think we can help as, as a national partner, as a national digital strategy system. I think we can bring more resources and tools to bear for that sort of purpose. I also think, you know, when I've met with state directors, there's only a handful. There's 109 total in the system. I've met maybe 10 so far that have a pretty substantial digital infrastructure in their state for extension. Most of them are in early stages, like um, Penn State has the Atlas system that they're going to be rolling out this fall, which I think is great for, you know, data-driven strategic decision-making and digital delivery of programs and information materials and the user database that backs that up. Um, very few states have that infrastructure. So I'd like to see eExtension. We're in a role where we can help accelerate and amplify the adoption of those kinds of practices so we can help really build state capacity. Because I, I think digital ways of working can create more scale and greater impact for all the individuals on the ground but it cha it changes how you work and that's a you know that takes a long time it takes um, new strategies but I think we can help and that's what I'm excited about so you've done a lot of work in the innovation field um, and that seems to be something that is is being stressed with the with e extension right now. Um, how do you see e-extension? What role will e-extension play in innovation, you know, throughout the system, this, the cooperative extension system? Well, I'd like our our core team, which I consider to be, you know, the, the people that are paid through the membership fees. We're a foundation on a membership model now, so membership fees and our funding that we, um, we've been getting, we've been fortunate to uh, win every year uh, through the competitive grant process with USDA NIFA funding, the NTAE grant, which we just put in last week. Um, you know, using that um, you know, that just took my mind to a whole other area, getting into, getting into that grant. Because we're a foundation now, which really changes. There's two big things, just to get back to your first question for a minute, one thing I should have mentioned. Two big things that are different. One is the kind of a, the system asking us to help them wield the digital strategies and tools in new ways, right, for increased impact really is the bottom line. The other one is they said, we want you to be a membership organization. Not all of us are just going to pay automatically through an allo you know, a annual allocation. You know, we want it to be an option. So that, and I like that focus better. It's saying we want to engage with you in a different way. Some people will be premium members, some will be basic, everyone will benefit you know, in some way. But that's a big strategic change. There's only one other partner embedded in Cooperative Extension that I know of that uses that model, and that's the 4-H Council. And I, I think this is a healthy thing for sort of an ecosystem networked or an organization. But I think one of the things that we can um, bring to the system is we can build capacity across the system to recognize, define innovation for what we mean in it for it with Cooperative Extension. So define it, identify it, incubate it in the context of extension, and then really focus on dissemination. So we just funded um, nine innovation projects and three innovation fellows. <laughs> Don't ask me to list them, but they're on the website. <laughs> I'm still in the process of meeting everybody and talking to them. But I think, you know, it's one thing to identify and incubate. That's what we did through that call for proposals and that funding. I think we need to spend more time on the incubation side, the adoption and the adoption of innovation. So in what ways can we, you know, help those um, projects experiment and mature what's successful and help that spread and proliferate in useful ways to other people across the system, you know, the 109 institutions, the 15,000 or so people on, on the ground. Um, I think that's where we can play an important role. So we want to become stronger, we want to have stronger expertise uh, and our core team, the people that work with us through communities, the people that we fund through innovation projects and fellowships, 
Uh, we want to actually have some formal professional growth opportunities so people can build their skills around, you know, spotting, incubating, and spreading innovation. Get get some common language going. So I, I'm really excited about that because innovation in our, in our context here for cooperative extension and addressing community issues, you know, is different than corporate innovation. We can learn from it, but it's it's much it's more like social entrepreneurship than it is product and market innovation. Can you talk a little bit more about that definition of innovation? I'm, honestly, here at NDSU, we've got an innovation team. We've talked about this issue and struggled with it a little bit. And um, how, what it what what constitutes innovation? I know at MSU Global, <laughs> you were involved in a paper where you, you know, where that was one of the things you defined innovation. So, how do you think of innovation, especially in that cooperative <laughs> extension? How did I define it in that paper, Bob? Maybe you can remind me. I don't me. know if I can quote that or not. I know that it. <laughs> I know that there was. Uh, that it ended with, uh, uh, you know, actual results or something like that, or tangible results. And I liked that part a lot, uh, the, the results. results part, okay. <laughs> so, you know, there's so many different, I mean, and innovation is kind of like a hot term. It's like the word virtual was, you know, 15 years ago. Um, it's used and misused in so many ways. But I think in the context of e-extension, you know, I started out and I worked with uh, Jerry Thomas and uh, Terry Meisenbach when we went to Pittsburgh on our innovation quest. We just said, well, let's just dive in and start finding out what people think is innovation and let's start telling those stories because I think storytelling is a big piece of what we can amplify across the whole system. And we sat down and we really started thinking, well, there's so many, depending on your where you're standing, what you think is innovative, some people just think is new and shiny or it's a new tool or something unfamiliar must be innovative, you know. Something that promises more results, you know, must be innovative, and that's okay. But I like a little more precision. So we started using that. Um, I think it's called that Arnshoff model, the, the quadrants, where one one quadrant is product and the other quadrant is uh, market. And the goal in corporate America is to head to that upper right-hand quadrant where you're looking at new market and new product, or you're, or you know, you're in the bottom right-hand quadrant, which is um, maybe existing, new new product, existing market, but there's a really big focus on new product or going off into new markets with your existing product. Now those are the forms of innovation you hear about. So I kind of started with that and I asked Terry and Jerry, I said, well, why don't we map what we think are innovations in cooperative extension on this quadrant and see where they fit. And of course they were all over the map, all right? And the ones in the upper right hand corner weren't necessarily more valuable than the ones in the bottom left even or the bottom right. So we started playing with, well, what are those dimensions that would actually make sense in the extension context? Because if you talk to people on the ground who are moving the needle on issues like community food security, for example, what are they doing? They're building relationships. They're building coalitions. They're facilitating people and informing those conversations with information. They're actually taking action through new relationships. So instead of market, I thought, well, maybe it's more like relationships. And instead of product, maybe it's more like ways of working or something. So we, I played with that a little bit. But on this most recent uh, trip, I just came back from Rhode Island. I was at the ECOP meeting, you know, meeting with the leadership of Extension across the country. And I came back with a different model. I'll try it out on you, Bob. Like, what if those dimensions of those quadrants are urgency and results? You know, we like to use the word impact. And that's also kind of a mushy word because so many different people have attachments to it. So I like the word results, but impact and results. So what are the new shiny things, or maybe not so new shiny things, that are wielding and are giving us the best results in the issues that are most, most urgent in our communities? And it doesn't, I'm, that's maybe not a definition of innovation, but I, that's kind of how I'm looking at the results of innovation. So ways of working, relationships and tools that are making a difference on urgent issues, right, in communities. So we have to be able to measure the results in order to know if you're going there, right? So what's wielding results on urgent issues? That's the lens I'm going to try using now uh, as we look at what we've already funded, what things are in the works, what communities are doing, uh, what new proposals you know come up uh, next year. We'll probably have another round of funding, I hope, uh, for innovation projects, and maybe we'll, well by then we'll have matured our concepts a little bit more. But I'm I'm kind of toying with that. What's what activities are giving us results 
on urgent issues. And I don't mean just avian flu, you know, obesity, family, you know, community prosperity. Those are a little, maybe slower moving or longer standing issues than emergency things like pest and disease, you know, and crops. But that's kind of how I'm looking at it. What do you think, Bob? I, I like it. Um, you know, and I, I want to thank Ann Adrian because she shared the actual quote that I was I was trying to recall here. Oh, thank you, let's, Ann. <laughs> let's put it on the screen here if we can. And, and it's... Uh, the quote from the MSU Global uh, article is uh, the definition of innovation uh, as creating a creative act or solution that results in a quantifiable gain. So that's the results part that I was, oh, that I was okay. liking oh, no. a lot. Yeah, so, yeah thank you. I'm yeah, still thank aligned you. with my past definition. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so, so thanks to Anne, and I want to remind you that if you want, you have questions for Chris, uh, please submit them through the Q&A app. Uh, or on Twitter, uh, just include a mention of WDNEXT. That's the Working Differently in Extension Twitter account, at WDNEXT, and, and we'll pass your question along. Uh, Chris, you mentioned going to ECOP, um, and in the blog post that announced your hire as CEO, you were quoted as saying, you know, it's time for uh, eExtension to form even deeper partnerships with cooperative extension directors and administrators. Mm -hmm. um, how distanced do you think eExtension had become from directors and administrators? And as a follow-up, so, uh, you know, how are, how are we going to rectify that or make those relationships deeper? Well, that's a good question. So how big is the gap? So I think that over time, the expectations of eExtension, just looking back briefly, I don't want to spend a lot of time in the past, but I think you know, with 109 special interests out there, right, we have 109 potential members. And without um, good mechanisms to, you know, kind of like a, um, a diffuse mission, right, the mission was sort of it got a lot of creep in it, you know, the scope sort of got really spread out. So different people thought e-extension meant different things depending on the parts that they touch. So some people who really like and use and benefit from ask an expert to scale up the expertise in their state, that's what they think e-extension is, right? People who are funded for an innovation project think that that's what it is. People who are have um, staff deeply involved in a really active community practice or learning network. That's what they think it is. So they all have the different views, you know, of the elephant. That's natural for an organization that's been around for a decade. So um, it's not so much that there's a gap, but by deeper I mean listening more deeply and listening like, like an anthropologist would listen, right? Observe and listen for ways that digital tools and strategies that we can bring to the system or support or embed in people's ways of working can make a difference towards what we just talked about, right? having an impact, especially on urgent issues. Um, and I think we have a lot of those ways of working already in place that we can share and share more, but it's it's not like, oh, here's a you know, website, come to it and use our stuff. We need to, we need to work differently. E-Extension needs to work differently and forge true partnerships in solving problems, not just with the directors, because they have their own, you know, issues and ways of working. You know, the director's day is very different than, um, you know, an extension educator's day. And what the directors really want is for us to serve those extension educators, because the way that they're successful in their state is when those educators make a big difference on the issues that they're tackling, you know, in their plan of work, which is a reflection of what's going on in their communities and their neighborhoods and their regions. So, and I think that's the, that's a gap in communication and focus that I noticed, and that's one of the first things that we did. We had a meeting in Atlanta about a month ago, and we focused on those 15,000 people, and that's still, that's our new focus. And people ask, who's your primary audience now? It's those 15,000 folks on the ground, educators, agents, whatever their title is. There's at least six different titles I understand across the system. And there may be more than 15,000, there may be less, but that's our primary audience. And then to the extent that we need to back out and, okay, in order to serve those folks and help them make progress on their issues, do we need to support them in supporting their volunteers, right? In what ways do they need to, do they need support in spreading information around to their publics? In order to move on an issue, you usually have to raise awareness. You've got programs, of course, that you're doing. How can we support that? So you, you would, might see us touching 
other audiences, other stakeholders or volunteers or the public, but it would be in service to the work of those 15,000 educators on the ground. And I think that's what the, if, the, no director says, go do that. Like, they don't word it like that. That's, us to, uh, that's up to us to interpret <laughs> how we can best solve their problem. But what they say is, we need you to help us have a bigger impact. We need you to help us tell the story. We need you to help us spread our resources around, get, give us scale, right? Um, and those are all things technology can help do. They won't tell us how to do it. We have to listen deeply and figure that out. But oh, that's a kind of challenge we all love. So I think it, there's lots of synergy there. So I think it's just it's listening in deeper ways and engaging in a different way that's much more proactive in how people get their work done, meaning the 15,000. So how can we be their partner in getting their work done? So you, you mentioned... Uh... Uh, some of the things that you know you have believe in or resonated with you at the very beginning we talked about sort of uh, some alignment with with Kevin Gamble so who I think might mm -hmm. be listening and and uh, uh, lots of you uh, who are listening know um, and you've also blogged about um, you know the power of open so do you think that all rights reserve copyright is holding cooperative extension back Oh, interesting way to word it. Well, for a system that's 100 years old, that was probably the first knowledge management system, right? Knowledge distribution system. It was created in an age where, you know, if you wanted to lock something up, you had to actually go lock it up. You know, you had to put the C on it, and you had to go mail it off to the copyright office. Everything we did was automatically open. It was branded our school, so people knew the source, but it wasn't. Um, it wasn't behind a firewall. It wasn't expected that you were going to have to license it. And I think that was an important cultural environment that we worked in and we were part of, right? We created, Extension still creates all kinds of wonderful resources. I wonder, and I don't know what the possibilities are yet, but this is one thing I'm exploring. If we weren't so locked up, mostly unconsciously locked up, because most people are still not aware that things have changed and that they're not operating that. It, they don't know until they go to do something and they have to get legal a d legal document signed, do they realize that their expected way of working is not the way the world works anymore <laughs> and that things are locked up unless they say otherwise. Most people are totally unconscious of it you know, until they have a legal agreement to sign. I think if our information was open by design, we could be leveraging our ecosystem of volunteers and community members and social change advocates that we work with on these issues in our communities, we could take advantage of more ways to distribute our information farther so that it could have a bigger impact. I mean, it does, just because you openly license it doesn't mean it's going to spread around, right? Most of the time it'll sit there just like anything else is going to sit there. But if by design we're already working with lots of different stakeholders and information services, if we promoted that our, we want our information to be used, and if we make that easy and easier, I think it could add to our impact. I mean, the CG centers, which are the research, international research centers funded by um, you know, USAID and United Nations and other groups like that, their IL ILRI, which is their livestock group, and ICRSAT, which is a group in India that specializes in, in certain um, grain crops, they found that they're re they use open licensing for all of their research now. And they're starting to see the results of that through by tracking the spread and trying to get more qualitative stories about how that information is used. So there are more research groups that are um, theoretically buying into the notion that if we just take the restrictions off, we can help spread things easier. The whole GoDan, you know, international conversation, I'd like to see e-extension be a bigger part of that, and cooperative extension as a whole. That's the global open uh, data for agriculture and nutrition. So those are standards for how to share data so that it can be useful. And I'm not just talking about, you know, tip sheets, but data sets, okay? And this is the medical side of the world is is in a lot of ways much farther along than the agriculture side of the world. So I see a lot of potential. I all, but I also see I'm not an advocate for everything being open. You know, Kevin will disagree with me. <laughs> he thinks it shall be 100% open and everything transparent. And I can see 
business reasons why that's just not going to work. We are an ecosystem. We have multiple stakeholders. We have to be cognizant of their different value systems and ways of working. I would, if it was up to me, I would, and I will be promoting open data sharing for everything that we do through e-extension to the extent that we can possibly do it. But if somebody really has issues, but that's the exception, not the rule for me, because I just think there's lots of there's lots more we could do if we will op make ourselves more open for people to share our information and research around. And I do also see it as a two-way street, right? It's not just spreading our information, you know, the expert-driven model, but it's also receiving information and trends and questions. Um, I think that's all part of the open approach. We're uh, getting a little bit short on time. I want to I want to recognize at least a couple of uh, people who have been interacting with the podcast today. Um, Paul's here. You guys might see him at the bottom of the screen now, but he did uh, <laughs> he did submit a a, a a quotation here from MSU Global about innovation not is not simply a good idea, but rather the, the development of a new idea or application of the idea in a new context that people can use, engage in, buy, sell, experience, and otherwise want. So thanks for that. I think that provides some clarification there. Um, uh, Paul, thanks for that. Uh, I like and, that. And uh, Kevin's Kevin's on as well. Uh, I'm just I won't I won't put his his comments on the screen, but I will share with you, Chris, that he said <laughs> he said but we but we mostly agree. Uh, and uh, to part of your response, uh, you know, he he concurs. He he says true. So uh, thanks for sh for chiming in, uh, Kevin. Steve Hadcox on Twitter uh, mentioning uh, the interview and WD in EXT, and uh, he says good to hear Christine say that extension peeps our primary audience uh, during this hangout. So uh, thanks Steve for for that comment as well. Uh, so uh, Christine, thanks so much for your time um, and your input. Uh, this is the time of of the sort of rebooted podcast where we, we're going to take a little time and talk about uh, the EdTech Learning Network and about new ideas and we're going to keep Chris on the line in case she has she has things she wants to share as well. But Paul Hill from Utah State University and the EdTech Learning Network has has joined us now. So uh, first thing we got to need to get out of the way, Paul, is the, the tweet up. When's the next tweet up and uh, for EdTech Learning Network and, and what are we going to be talking about? Oh, excellent question. Uh, the next tweet up is in August. And it is August 6th. Uh, it's on a Thursday at 12 p.m. Mountain Time, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, we are uh, we're putting some ideas together. We've got a lot of... Uh, the hard part is is not trying to find some things to talk about. It's it's trying to figure out what not to talk about So <laughs> and to keep a focus. So uh, we might be uh, talking about some more live streaming. Uh, we've touched on a lot of digital scholarship, uh, social media. Uh, Jamie had brought up podcasting and uh, wearable technology as well as uh, uh, talking about video creation again. And so that was one of the first uh, topics we discussed. And so, I'll, I mean, just a few months ago, a lot more, a lot more technologies come out that's made uh, you know things uh, easier to create, uh, whether it's just um, infographics and things um, or uh, video, like you know, short, uh, short videos. So uh, that's we'll kind of uh, we'll kind of go from there and. Uh, Decide in the next couple of days. We have a meeting on the fourth. So, uh, but yeah, just just been keeping busy with uh, um, working with other land grants and uh, helping them kind of create ed tech units in their um, in their programs, and then also um, working with some universities who are looking at um, ed tech positions. And so, um, I know OSU, um, the Ohio State, has a lot of experience with that. And so, uh, we you know talked to Michigan State, Minnesota, Penn State, and Wyoming. And so uh, we're excited about you know getting more people involved so if people want to take part in the tweet up how can they f uh, find out how to do that um, what we suggest uh, you do is go to twubs.com uh, t-w-u-b-s um, make sure you have your twitter account set up uh, but go to twubs.com slash edtechln e-d-t-c-h-l-n and, uh, and then you can follow the stream a little bit quicker there's kind of a delay on twitter and so, uh, so I mean, we're using the hashtag to um, curate information um, throughout the weeks, and then uh, and then we use the hashtag uh, for that Thursday 
um, when we do our tweet ups. And so it's worked really well, and uh, we generally get about anywhere from a dozen to two dozen uh, participants, and uh, two thirds of which are usually new people we haven't uh, met before, uh, usually spikes after presentations at different conferences, and so we're looking forward to our upcoming uh, NAE 4HA and then the uh, NEA um, FCS and then um, NAE <laughs> PSDP uh, conferences, and so uh, if you're not sure what those are, just uh, Google them. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so we've, we've got. Uh, I'm not even sure what they all are actually. There, um, somebody but, did give me a 25-page a uh, acronym manual. I could, I should probably just post that or tweet out each one. You know, it's 20 pages long. <laughs> yeah, I don't have enough. Uh, there's not enough characters uh, available on Twitter to just tweet the actual name. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, we've got uh, we've got some presentations coming up at each of those conferences, and we also do like live meetups. Uh, at those conferences so we can meet face to face and that really helps break the ice for people that aren't really quite um, you know comfortable on Twitter yet but uh, more and more people have become uh, active on Twitter at least starting with with lurking and listening and uh, and then and then engaging and so I mean I'll take any steps you know baby steps in the beginning and and full engagement as as we go on but uh, we're just been really happy with the, the success of the network and helping people find technology uh, just this, you know, the other day I had a, a tweet from Brooke Edmonds asking about, uh, you know, a, different tools for stabilization when using live streaming, and uh, now we're looking at 3D printed uh, models on Thingiverse and you imagine, and uh, looking at ways, you know, we can we can, uh, you know, turn it into a maker project. So. Yeah, I really, I really admire the work of the Learning Network. You're doing so much to build the capacity of states. You know, the the digital capacity, their agility, and their ways of working. So, you know, you're, you guys are a really powerful learning network. So thanks for all you do. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Chris. That's that's well stated, and it's uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, we're getting EdTech Learning Network involved in the Working Differently in Extension podcast, because they do a lot of work in that area. And also, uh, Jamie and Paul bugged me to get the podcast going again. So that was another reason that they're <laughs> being Plus, you know, so. Paul, you're at... You're at um, Utah State University, the home of Open. You know, when David Wiley was there, I used to tell him, you know, he should lobby the legislature. Of course, there's double meaning to this, but you know how the license plates always have a saying on it. I said Utah should say the Open State. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Paul, and thanks, Chris. Uh, I want to remind our listeners that you can find out more about the Working Differently podcast at www.ag ndsu.edu slash working differently. Just click on the working differently in extension podcast logo. We're also on SoundCloud now, soundcloud.com slash working differently. And our next working differently in extension podcast, our guest will be Eric Staffney of Mississippi State University. We'll be talking about a series of blog posts that uh, he wrote for the EdTech Learning Network blog on the intersection of digital technology and scholarship. You can join us live, just like we were live today on August 17th, 2 p.m. Central Time. Keep up to date with uh, live recordings and future podcasts by following us on Twitter. Again, it's WDNEXT, WDNEXT on Twitter. All right, thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great day. Paul, Chris, thanks again. This has been Thank the Working Differently in Extension podcast. <laughs>